All right, hello once again, Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. And as part of the Rankin Technical College Application and Website Development, or AWD 1111 Database Driven Web Development Course, I've been doing a series of video presentations. I started with about 20 different um, videos based off of some of the handbooks, PDF files that have been written by Flavio Copes in his Valley of Code. Uh, website. I did presentations on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Then I went back and downloaded into my YouTube playlist for this class some of the videos that I did from the AWD 1000 class, which was some JavaScript review. Now I'm going over Brad Traversy's Web Dev Guide. Mr. Traversy is a self-taught web developer, extraordinaire in my opinion. And I have gone over part one, which was learning and planning, and it kind of gave an overview of what was going to be discussed. Chapter two, we did front end basics. Chapter three, we did front end advanced. And now we're into chapter four, which is back end development. So, as mentioned here, in this chapter, we look at the technologies and concepts you need to know as a back end or full stack developer including the programming languages used, back-end frameworks, database systems, and more. And I mentioned this earlier, I'm going to say it again, and that is the fact that I'm going to concentrate on what is taught at Rankin Technical College. So there will be things in here that I'm going to skip, such as I'll talk JavaScript, I won't talk Python, I won't talk Go, I won't talk PHP, but I will talk C Sharp because we teach both JavaScript and C Sharp here at Rankin. So up until this point, we've been talking about the front end. Now we're going to switch to the back end. It says first we have programming languages. JavaScript is a language of the browser. It's also becoming one of the languages of the server. All right. It says just about any programming language can be used for certain aspects of web development. So the I'm, again, I'm going to concentrate on the ones we'll be working with. So the first one mentioned here is Node. And as said, Node is not a language. It is a JavaScript runtime. What happened was um, a developer, probably it says about 13 years ago, went and took the engine that's used to power Chrome all right, and that is, I think, the V8 engine, and made it available for JavaScript. So as it says, it essentially allows JavaScript to run on the server, so become back-end as opposed to running on the browser, where it's front-end. It includes the Node Package Manager. They say with a rich ecosystem, literally it has somewhere around a half million different libraries that you can download. It's high performance. It's set up as a non-blocking event-driven architecture. And by non-blocking, as he says there, it means it doesn't block further operations from happening. Non-blocking methods are executed asynchronously. All right. Because of the way Node works, it's great for things like APIs, microservices, real-time applications, but it's not good for CPU heavy tasks that require a lot of calculations. As it says there, Node is his first choice, and that's what we're concentrating on as well. Now, don't worry about this. This is just regular JavaScript. All right, we'll talk more about Node later. I'm going to skip Deno. I'm going to skip Python. It's not that these are not important, but they're not taught here. Now, for C Sharp, we do teach C Sharp at Rankin Technical College. But as of right now, we do not teach web development using C Sharp. Rather, we use window desktop applications and create more or less, we create business apps. All right. That's really all I have to say about that. C Sharp is object oriented and strongly typed. Okay. There is an example of a C Sharp program. Golang, I'm going to skip. Ruby, I'm going to skip. I've taught Ruby before. All right. Java, again, we teach Java, but we teach Java for mobile applications. 
We do not teach Java or things like the Spring Boot framework. We don't teach that. Here's an example of some Java. And what you should notice is that the example here on page 174 of C Sharp and the example down on page 177 for, for Java, they're not that different from one another. Okay, all right. Kotlin is basically been designed by Google and it's meant to replace Java as the language of choice for Android development. It's still getting there. There are things that you can do with, um, the, in some ways with Kotlin, they've dumbed down Java to make it work. All right. In other ways, it might be more complex. I'm not going to talk about Rust or Scala or R or Swift. Other than with Swift to tell you that at the school I used to teach at, we taught both um, development for Android and development for iOS. So I've taught Swift before. Okay. C and C++ we don't teach here. So let's get into talking about server-side frameworks. But before we do, and I'm very close in here, I'm going to pause for just a moment. All right. And I've got to make a phone call. So I will come back momentarily. All right. I apologize for that interruption. And we're going to pick it up with server-side frameworks. And again, we are going to concentrate on the ones that we're going to be using here at Rankin. So that'll be Express, to be honest with you. Not Rails, not Django, and I'm not sure what that is. So, as with the front end, we have web frameworks for the back end to try to make your life easier. These frameworks are designed to handle HTTP requests and return a response, which typically will contain HTML rendered on the server, or they can return JSON. Now, <coughs> Some frameworks are more opinionated than others, and what that means is some of them require you to do things in a certain way. All right. The advantage of those is that you get more out of the box. In other words, you've got to do it this way, but you do it this way and it works. On the other hand, when you use something that's more minimalistic, that's more non opinionated, such as express there are different ways that you can do things and express doesn't tell you what to do in fact if i go out here and let's just go out here and just to show you this if i go out to i think it's expressjs.com you'll notice that right away it says that it's unopinionated and it's minimalistic so the idea is you have several different ways that you can do the same thing and you're not forced to do it in a certain way. All right, MVC. MVC is model view controller. We will end up using MVC in this class when we create our applications. First with just Node, all right, and Node and Express. But what's going to happen with model view controller is the majority of the information that we're going to be using for our database work will be put in a folder called model or models. The work that we want, the, the interfaces, etc., that we want to show the user will be put in a views folder. And the logic that will allow us to shift back and forth between this stuff and have our routing mechanisms in it will be in a folder called controllers. Now that's high level, but we're separating this stuff into three different logical components. As mentioned here, MVC is a popular design pattern. All right. So he gives you a little summary here of what each of these components does. And as said there, the model is the part that deals with the data. The data can come from anywhere, but 
most of the stuff we'll do in this class, that the data will come from a database. All right. The view is the user interface. It's what you end up showing the person who's running the application. All right. Now, I may have shown you this. I may not have, but I'm going to show you something in here anyway. And that is, let's see. I want to show you an example, at least one example, of what we're going to be working with. Let's see. Let's see. This, this may or may not be the one, but we'll find out very shortly. Oh, that's going to take way too long. Forget that. So let's see. Try to run it from here and see if this works. Don't worry about what all this stuff means. You're going to learn all of it. Is it NPM start? I don't know why it's... Let's see. All right, so we're going to build together something that looks like this. All right, what is it? Well, you can search in here. So let's say that I search for, I don't know, Avengers. All right, and it'll show me it's going out and it's using the IMDB or the Internet Movie Database API, which is a database of online movies, and it goes out there and it finds all the stuff with the Avengers. Now let's go back to Harry Potter again. When you go out there, you don't have to, you know, this is just giving a screenshot and it's giving the text. Notice if I click on one of these, so if I use Deathly Hallows Part 1, it tells me the type of movie it is, a little bit of a summary, who the director was, the cast, and how much it made. These are just some of the things that we plucked off of there. All right. When it was made, etc. So this is the kind of thing that we're going to end up creating. What you see here, what you see here is what? It's the view. All right. The data that we're using from the IMDB or Internet Movie Database, that's the model. And the controllers are what, what allows us to make sure that as we iterate from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows 1, as we iterate from there to Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey, that it knows where to go. All right. Hopefully what I'm saying is making at least a little bit of sense to you. All right. So... The view, again, is the user interface display, and the controller is the interface between the model and the view. Technically, the model and the view in an MVC type of thing should never, ever communicate with one another. All right? Rather, in, in our case, we will create routes in a controller's folder that will allow us to go back and forth. All right. Node has a ton of frameworks. The best-known one is Express. All right. As I said already, it's minimalistic, which means there's not a bunch of stuff included. It's not opinionated, which means you can do things in a lot of different ways. I have not used Fastify, so I'm not going to talk about it. I have done a little bit of work with Koa. And the thing with Koa is it's, it's simpler. It's simple. All right. You can use it, and it's also got a lot of stuff kind of baked into it for being able to do validation. I've not used Nest. Some of these I've looked at just haven't used them. I haven't used Adonis. I'm going to skip all the Python stuff. I'm going to skip all the PHP stuff. I've taught PHP before, and I've, I know Python because I taught a seminar on it years ago. What we used to do in the C-sharp class, we're not doing it now, but what we used to do, is we taught ASP.NET in there. 
So we taught how to build web-based applications using C Sharp. When I came here six plus years ago, we were teaching the class, the AWD 1100 Programming Fundamentals with C Sharp class the way we are now. That is, we were teaching it using creating business applications using Windows Forms. Then we went for a couple years and we went this way. Now we're back to the way it used to be. I've worked with Blazor, but never really used much of it. Never done anything with Golang, Jin, Bego. I've taught Ruby on Rails. That's been probably 15 years. I've taught Ruby with using Ruby on Rails. I've looked at Sinatra, but I've never done a thing with it. And the Java frameworks, I know what Spring is, but I've never used it. I've never used Struts. For Kotlin, I've never used Spring. I've never used Vertex. I've never done anything with Scala or Rust. So let's jump into databases. Where am I for time? We are just fine. All right. Backend and full stack developers need to work with a database. There are two basic kinds. This right here is being free. I, I'm not even sure what database that is. We will work in here with MySQL, MySQL, and with MongoDB, which is this. All right. Relational database management systems are very regimented, regimented rather. As mentioned here, they store data in tables and rows, and they use the structured query language to use CRUD operations. In other words, create, read, update, and delete. All right. On the other hand, and I'm not talking Postgres, we do use MySQL in here. All right. We use the MS SQL server in the AWD 1100 class, the programming fundamentals with C Sharp. We use the SQLite in the AWD 1112 mobile application development class, but we will use MongoDB in here. As it says, it's a different type of, type of database. It is a NoSQL database. NoSQL does not mean it has no SQL. The no here means this means not only SQL. All right, it's a document database. It holds a collection of documents rather than a table of records. So a collection is like a table, a document is like a record, all right? But they're stored differently. Each document is scored, stored as really a BSON object. A BSON, which is binary JavaScript object notation, is similar to a JSON object, all right? It's very popular, as it says right here, in the Node.js world. And again, with MernStack, all right, with MeanStack, with MevinStack, all the M's here, here, and here stand for MongoDB. And it says Mongo has a cloud version called Atlas, and we'll use that. I don't think we'll have time to get into Firebase, all right, but we do use Firebase as pretty much our database of choice in the AWD 1112 mobile application development class. So I'm not going to say any more about it. This is Supabase. I don't know what that is. Redis I've heard of but never used. They give you some SQL here. All right, using a select statement, an insert statement, an update statement, and delete statement. They're fine. I'm not going to talk about them. All right. ORMs, as it says here, an ORM is an object relational mapper. No matter what database you learn, you will also have to learn the ecosystem of tools to work with it. There are tools like MySQL Workbench, MongoDB Compass, which are the two that we look at basically. In addition, you have something called an ORM or an object relational mapper. And the author says, this is a layer that sits on top of your database that you can query and manipulate data with. Some frameworks have built-in ORMs, all right? When using Node.js with a relational database, one you can use is SQLize. I've used it. I'm not sure if we'll use that or not. We will definitely use Mongoose when we are using MongoDB. You don't have to worry right now about what that means.
All right. So let's jump into REST APIs and HTTP. We will talk quite a bit in this class about REST. Okay. And REST API. REST stands for represent, Representational State Transfer. That's the REST part. So it says understanding and building REST APIs. So we're talking here not just about using existing APIs, but about building your own APIs that do what? Whatever you want them to do. It's something it says you should learn early on as a back end or a full stack developer. REST APIs conform to the REST architectural style within RESTful services. Remember again, I know I'm a broken record here, but API stands for Application Program Interface. It is, for lack of better words, it is the equivalent of you using or setting up a contract with the software where the software part of the contract says, I will provide these, this service or these services for you. And with your part of the contract, you say, okay, since you're providing those services, I will use them in this manner. Again, again as mentioned previously, REST stands for representational state transfer. And as it says, we usually make our hypertext transfer protocol requests to work with data or resources on the server, typically that's stored in a database. You access things from an HTTP client, which could be a standalone program. We will talk about what Postman is and you will use it in here. And you will do stuff like this. If this makes no sense, don't let it throw you. When we use Postman, you don't even have to type in everything that's shown here. A GET request, in this case, this would say that I've got uh, some domain someplace. I mean, it's this could be our own domain. And in there, I've got a folder called API. And in that folder, I've, call, I've got a folder called to-dos. When I do a get, it says, I want you to show me every one of the to-dos that's in that list. When I have post, it means this is typically associated with a form which means that I want to go and add, in this case, a new to-do. When I do a put, it's used to update data. And you'll notice that when I do a put, I'm telling it which one of these. So this would be something with an ID of 100 that I want to update. And finally, the same thing with delete. I've got to give it one. If I do a put and I don't give it which one I want to update, it'll update everything. That's virtually, you never want to do that. If I give it a delete and I don't give it an ID, it'll delete everything. All right. So it says here, as a backend developer, you would create these endpoints and fetch the to-dos from a database and send them in a response. The front end, you just care about what it looks like and that it works. The full stack developer will do both. You have to work with status codes, these are things that can be returned when you make an HTTP request. Ideally, what you're looking for is a 200. A 200 means everything was hunky-dory. Everything worked. All right? I very rarely have ever worked with, with the 100s, which are informational. There's different degrees of success. That's why there's different numbers in here. Maybe at some time in your life, you've gone out to a site and it's done a redirect for you. For instance, what used to happen is when I went out to, to Java, I went out to java.sun, java.sun.com. That used to be how you would get to Java. But you'll notice when I hit enter, it redirects me to oracle.com slash java slash technologies. Why does it do that? Because several years ago, Oracle bought Java. So they push you to an Oracle site rather than a straight Java site. All right. 400 and 500, they're both error conditions. 400 means it's something you did. 500 means it's something you have no control over because it's something on the server side. All right. So here, here are more detailed explanations.
GraphQL is something I've wanted to take a look at for a while, but have not done anything with. Let's just very quickly note that it says, it's something both front-end and back-end developers can use. It's a data query and manipulation language for your APIs. You can create a GraphQL server on the back end to work with data, and you can use it with multiple languages, such as Node and JavaScript. It's used in a similar way to a REST API, but there are advantages. Biggest, as it says, being that you can request specific data from a single, one single endpoint. It's strongly typed, and they show it in here again. Looks similar. All right says on the left how you would write a query. And on the right, I believe, is what gets returned. So what's getting returned here looks like JSON. And this is the syntax for GraphQL. I've done nothing more with it. I'm not going to say anything more about it. I've not done anything with Apollo. All right. So let's jump into talking about VEC before we do. Authentication and authorization. Let's see how much longer this particular section is. And we talk about deployment in here also. So there's still quite a bit in here. Okay. So let's jump back up. I think that was about 206. It was not. Just did this. So I'm going to stop right now. And I will pick it up again. Starting on page about 2, what, 14? talking about authentication and authorization. Be back with that shortly.